Katie, welcome to Sheffield. And it's not the first time you've been to Sheffield, but your story started pre-war in Austria. Yes. So how and why did you end up in the UK? Ah, well, basically because I'm a Jew. Mm. And um, in Austria and in, in Europe in general, uh, there was a great deal of anti-Semitism, which is anti-Jewish racism. Mm. Uh, and it culminated, uh, although it had always been there, it culminated in the Anschluss, which was when Austria uh, joined Germany to become part of the Third Reich. Um, and, you know, things became pretty grim for Jews. Uh, and uh, we lost our home, we lost our um, jobs. I mean, my father was no longer allowed to practice as a lawyer. I was expelled from school and... Um, how, how old were you at this time? I was eight and a half at the mm. time of the Anschluss. Mm. And it took us a year and a half to get all the visas and everything necessary to come out because you know, nobody wanted these refugees any more than they do now. Mm. And um, so it took a year and a half for us to get permission to come to England. Uh, and there were lots of conditions to that, like my parents weren't allowed to take any jobs except as domestic servants. So that's how they started out. But we did get away. We were, we were the lucky ones. Mm. Was, you talk about the um, when it came around, but were things gradually getting worse before then? Oh, indeed, the yes. Because the theme of Holocaust this year is about the erosion of, the, of freedoms. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Well, yeah, and uh, it, it is the, the challenge um, to the freedom to be who you are. That's mm. what well, that was really about, you know. We were not really expected to be Jews, you know. Mm. We weren't allowed to be Jews, and we were thought to be not part of the human race. Mm. Uh, Sorry, what you I, I, I was I was saying about the erosion. Oh, of the freedom, slow erosion, how, how yes. It, how gradually in, ah, in well, Germany, for instance, yes. during the nineteen thirties. You period. see, things were so bad in Germany that inflation was oh right through the roof. I mean, uh, huge unemployment, um, health problems, and Hitler and the Nazi Party saw that as a a way of getting on top and by using conspiracy theories, fake news, misinformation, blaring out the whole time. There was no social media, but there was radio, and there were newspapers, and it never stopped targeting the Jews because they were an easy target, you know. Jews have always been kind of um, identifiable. And they needed to blame somebody. Mm. So they blamed the Jews. And this grew and grew and grew. And people believed it because mm. they kept on being told. Mm. And wasn't, uh, wasn't it Goebbels who said, you, you repeat a lie often enough, it becomes the truth? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And um, anti-Semitism in, in Germany was, was, was rampant. Before the Anschluss, uh, there were a whole series of laws they called the Nuremberg Laws, which were anti-Jewish laws, um, which forbade Jews to actually to operate as normal citizens. Uh, Jews weren't allowed to uh, participate in, in, in concerts or go to cinemas or use the park or go to libraries or swim or... You know, it went on and on and on and on until life was um, pretty, pretty unbearable. And, and then all that moved to Austria. Mm. And, um, yeah. Uh, and I, the other European states as well, obviously. And later, yeah. uh, other Europe. But, I mean, that was after war was declared. Mm. Um, 
parts of Czechoslovakia were taken before. But, um, so oh. you, you moved to the United Kingdom. Was the intention actually to stay in the United Kingdom <laughs> or to go to the <laughs> States? Yeah. Indeed it was. In order to come to the United Kingdom, we had to sign, we, my parents, had to do several things. They had to say that they would only take jobs as domestic servants. Uh, they had to find a British citizen who would put down 50 pounds deposit, as it were, for each of us. And he also, or she also, had to declare that they would look after me until I was 18, if need arose. Uh, and my father did find somebody. He found a, a, a British Jewish lawyer who did all that. Which was wonderful because you know, fifty pounds for three people is now the equivalent, I'm told, of three thousand pounds. Right. That's a lot yes, of money. Yes, yeah. um, I'm glad to say we never used any of it, and mm. um, he never had to look after me either. Yeah. But then the final condition was, you could only use the visa with all those conditions if you were also on a list which was called a quota to go to America. Mm. So that this was only a, a, a stop on the way to safety, really. Mm. Uh, we were expected and were on the list to go to America. And what happened was that the war broke out and uh, that was no longer possible. They were no longer uh, transporting civilians in, mm. in, in, to America, so we stayed. Mm. And, uh, and then we got permission to stay, finally. So, so what happened during the war years when you were in the United Kingdom? Well, to begin with, my father became a butler mm. and my mother became a cook. Mm. And it was in a big manor house in, in Hertfordshire. And they weren't a nice family. Um, my parents had no... Um, wage at all. Mm. I was their wage, I was their salary, the fact that I was allowed to live with them. Mm. Um, and we stayed there until, now my father was interned uh, as an enemy alien because, you know, as you probably know, Churchill said, collar the lot because um, mm. <laughs> people didn't really know the difference between Jewish refugees and Germans who had been caught here, or yeah. Austrians. So they were all in turn together. But my father very soon was given the choice to join the British Army. Mm. And he did, he joined the Pioneer Corps. And so he was then going from place to place, being moving with the army. Mm. And um, my mother and I started to be camp followers. We yeah. followed him around, whatever it was. And my mother could always get a job as a cook or a chambermaid or whatever. Yeah. Mm. So that's how we got to England. And then post-war, you actually came, or your parents certainly, lived to live in Sheffield. Yes, yes. Yes, that was um, a long story. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you want to hear that long story? Well, you would like to hear it. If the Sheffield it. connection. If the Sheffield, Sheffield connection. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, at, at the end of the war, which it, by this time it was, um, my parents uh, were kind of drifting in the Midlands because uh, that's where my father got demobbed from the army. And um, they didn't have good jobs. They, they were struggling. And I was um, training with a, a young woman who I got very, very friendly with. Um, and she told this story to her father, who was apparently a rather influential man, turned out to be an Indian prince who owned two steel works in Sheffield. Mm. And he was so appalled to hear the story about my parents um, mm. that he offered them wonderful jobs here in Sheffield. Mm. Uh, my father was made the um, chief executive of the overseas kind of business that they were doing. And my mother was put in charge of all the canteens and mm. to run them and to renovate them and to spend money on them. Um, they thought they 
landed in heaven. Yeah. And, and this house was provided, a house yeah. in, in Whirlodale Road, yeah. uh, which I went to see today. Yes, yeah. <laughs> so it brings back memories. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. indeed. So after your, your parents left Sheffield, you, you picked up work and I understand you were a social worker. Yes, yes, yeah. I trained as a social worker. Um, and, and where was that? Where were you working? In London. In London. In London, yes, yes. Well, you know, they say that um, uh, survivors are, are likely to become savers because, you know, uh, it's the opposite of, isn't it, of being a perpetrator, you become a, a saver. And um, lots and lots of people I know who uh, were refugees became social workers. Yeah. The, the the theme of, of Holocaust in 2024 is the fragility of freedom and, and your work with the, the Holocaust Museum must pick up on, on some of those themes, how you know, fragile it is and how we need to preserve it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that really is true of all our freedoms, isn't it? But um, I think... Uh, Racism, and that's what anti-Semitism is. It's the oldest form of racism, anti-Jewish racism. I think racism um, challenges the freedom of just your being, of being who you are. It, 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 it challenges cosmically everything that is to do with you. Um, and. I think it's it's quite a good theme. To begin with, I I couldn't quite connect uh, what's what's that got to do with the Holocaust, but it has everything to do with the Holocaust because it is the fact that six million people died simply for who they were, mm. nothing to do with anything else, just who they were. And in your work going round to schools and other places. What's, what message do you want to convey to the young people? Do not listen to conspiracy theories. Get off your social media. Don't, don't do it, don't believe it. Find out for yourself about things before you, before you have an opinion. Think about it and find out. And, and be kind. Um, you know, kindness is such a a vital human possibility that you can be kind. In all situations, you can find a way to be kind. Mm. Um, and uh, that, that will help. But I think it's, it's well, love thy neighbour, isn't it? The tenant that we've got there. But I think it's very important, and you, uh, as somebody who's experienced this, to actually pass on your knowledge and actually lived experience of what the Holocaust was to perhaps dispel some of these conspiracy theories and Holocaust deniers? Yes, well, I hope, you know, if I speak to a class of, I don't know, 50 children, that, you know, maybe a few of them will come away and think, well, that's, I must think about that. I've got to sort this out for myself. Even young children, I, I, you know, children as young as, as 10 and 11, I speak to, and I just hope that they take away the fact that you have to think for yourself, you have to know for yourself what's right, and, and be kind, mm. and, yeah. The other things have happened subsequent to the Holocaust, and we talk about Rwanda. And mm, other indeed, other yes. And there are lessons to be learnt there, and again, mainland Europe as well, in Bosnia. And well, and not to mention Darfur and, Dar yeah, yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> Cambodia. And Cambodia, yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, and it, it, it happens again. So, although the Holocaust may seem to the young people, and certainly historical events, and perhaps related to mm, it's happening mm, in the mm, recent mm, past mm, as well. Mm, mm. Yeah, yeah, you know, the, after the Holocaust, the world said, never again. Yeah. yeah. 
but it has happened again and again and again. And, you know, where do we all stand in that? Yeah. 